Um, so thanks for everybody for coming to hear me chat. Don't be shy. There are seats in the front. Come on down. Um, as the title of this talk suggests, I'm going to spend a little bit of time today talking about my ongoing research in preschool, where I've been looking at pretend play, play narratives, naughtiness, and personhood. And I think people generally expect to find the first three things in anyone's research in preschool, but the last bit is where the wicket gets a little sticky. So before I get into anything else, I want to blast right off into talking about personhood and the status of childhood in the context of late modern schooling. Um, it's sort of my reason for living, and I tend to look at these things through a lens of naughtiness, agency, um, and fantasy play. Let's advance my slide. Okay. So we know that schools, uh, we know what they are and what they do, and we know that that's changing quite a bit. Some people call this trend radical centralization, and with it, um, I might call it the commodification of early childhood readiness. My feeling is that part of this is that children are conceptualized not as children, but as containers for future economic productivity and utilitarian rather than expressive selves. Meanwhile, the competing and contradictory discourses of the child as a nostalgic or expressive project also does little to recognize children's actual participation in social life or full personhood. Now, I was lucky enough to be doing my work in rural preschools, and I think that some of those settings are insulated a little bit from what we might call the effects of late modernity. Um, but there's also insulation in preschool because of the very nature of the everyday rebellions happening there amongst highly strategic and agentive small people. The place where I did my work, which I call New Elizabeth down preschool, um, children created and thrived in the in-between or the liminal spaces where leaky and viscous political and individual practices disrupted attempted regimes of control, order, and productivity. This was particularly visible in children's pretend play. These practices further created opportunities for destructive as well as generative resistant unrulinesses for children and adults alike. While it's important for rural ethnographers to resist the lure of facile romanticization of rural schooling and rural spaces, the generative possibilities afforded in this particular study context were largely borne out by the findings. Okay, so what does all this mean? And what does that have to do with preschool ethnography, which is what I'm supposed to be talking about today? Alan Prout wrote, and I quote, whilst the effects of all this gobbledygook on teachers and parents has been widely discussed, its impact on children has remained relatively muted in the public debate. End quote. Similarly, Sharon Stevens admonished us all to attend to the crucial task of developing more powerful understandings of the child in the structures of modernity. This is important to me as I sought ways to emphasize the child as agent in claiming and managing bodies and spaces, drawing on Markstrom and Halden's call to study the space that is given to children and on the other hand, how children assume power and make conquests and shape the institutions in which they participate. They are effectively small but mighty. Um, to that end, the study I'm talking about today focused on the everyday experiences of preschool children as understood through a lens of games and the powerful resistant practices in those games. And these are my research questions. So I chose to work with preschoolers not only because of my interest in capturing the immediacy of their move, their first move beyond family circle into a more public world of friends and play, but also in their coming together and play activities, which are prolonged and more common in preschool than in other grades, although I think we could all agree that more free play in all of the grades would be a very good thing. Finally, analyses of the preschoolers' games in my context are situated in the discordant late modern schooling environment in which they, their teachers and their parents and their school function and which informs the very structure of the spaces where they're doing the work of childhood. So now onto some juicy stuff. So I want to talk a little bit about naughtiness before I get any further. Because I did so much of uh, my work interested in personhood, naughtiness in preschool is a big part of that. And naughtiness, I mean N-A-U-G-H-T-I, naughtiness. Um, so I want to talk about that. When I ask adults what comes to mind when they think of the naughty child, they invariably come up with a scene from Maurice Sendak's picture book, Where the Wild Things Are, which is what we have up here, um, where a small boy named Max misbehaves. And Sendak writes, that night, Max wore his wolf suit and made mischief of one kind and another. His mother called him wild thing, and he said, I'll eat you up, at which point Max is punished by being sent to bed without eating anything at all. As Syndax draws Max in his world, we see Max become the animal his costume affords and throw himself headlong into mischief of all kinds, including, but not limited to threatening the family dog with a fork. 
It is a common discursive habit to make animals out of children to explain their naughtiness away and preserve the myth of childhood innocence and the primacy of the adult nostalgic project. Think about if as a parent or a teacher how many times you referred to children as little monsters or little animals or how many times this past Halloween season you saw costumes for children with little ears, right, to make them into literal little animals. However, just as Max later takes off his wolf suit and resumes good behavior and supper, we are also reassured that children can return from being wild, unruly animals to being people again, brought to heal, or at least taught proper behavior via adult regulation. This regulation is often incorrectly assumed to be an absolute good and that one cannot have too much of it. And as you might imagine, I would disagree. The relationship between childhood, adulthood, and mischief is complex and interrelated. Jones, Holmes, McRae, and McClure suggest that children's naughty behavior is a function of adult experiences of, quote, ontological insecurity. Um, so that means certain behaviors on the part of young people become untenable to teachers and other adults by making them insecure, even for a moment. They continue, quote, those ways in which the child is conceptualized, creating cognitive dissonance and leaving a severe sense of helplessness where everything that is of comfort in terms of what it means to be a teacher or other adult disintegrates and the clean and proper becomes soiled and is manifested in the improper child." End quote. To Jones and colleagues, it is in this way that children are produced as improper and in very early grades, it constitutes a reputation that follows them through school. It seems fair to say then that the improper child could be an adult construction adult experience and adult problem tied to mythologies of childhood in, in a sense and idealized passivity. So it's possible that mischievous behaviors are merely inconvenient for adults but very necessary for children and I don't mean this in a functional behavior analysis kind of way in which adults attempt to diffuse and control children by understanding the so-called function of their behavior. While I'm very cautious of romanticizing or over-interpreting children's activity, it is possible that children might employ the practice of mischief in emergently, emergently resistive ways, much like Max puts on his wolf suit with a degree of intentionality. These can be small, as Jones and colleagues observe children transforming locations of punishment, such as being sent to the naughty seat, into locations of amusement or even power. Jones writes of children um, who found other materials, such as nearby Velcro name stickers, and with which to distract themselves, thus change the discursive status of being sent to the naughty seat or timeout chair. The child transforms the space as a resistance to mechanisms of ever-tightening adult control, and so also they step outside the place of the child, having gone against what is customarily sanctioned within early years education as who the child can be. Their utterances jar against those boundaries by framing mechanisms in which we situate the child so as to know them." End quote. By making themselves strange in this way, they become terribly powerful disrupting the mechanisms by which they are produced as utilitarian containers for future economic productivity and demanding that adults around them engage with them as immediate persons doing the work of being rather than future persons being produced as becoming, to borrow from Quartrup. So Davies' uh, work on preschoolers and gender described a similar process at work. She noted that children were expected to be practicing the work of behaving oneself, and that this constant expectation seemed to rob them in some way of their personhood. Many teachers and other adults who are asked why children need to sit still, to listen, to take turns, to walk quietly in line, often answer that these skills are necessary so that the children can function in society get good jobs, go to college, do well in school, and other aphorisms that all point towards future economic tasks at the cost, possibly, of current personhood. Children's disruption of such futures might be interpreted as an assertion of the value of the current self and a question about the regulation of said futures. As Jamie Heckert writes, the practice of doing nothing, of play, of meditation, or of simply existing constitutes disobedience to the cult of productivity, economic and otherwise. This resistance, whether it be in the form of pulling apart the Velcro edges of the naughty seat or refusing to practice behaving oneself for the sake of an externally determined future of dubious value, is a specific kind of mischief that renders the subject unruly, unpredictable, and difficult to regulate. My favorite writer on unruliness is Akshay Khanna. Um, he says unruly politics constitute actions which escape, exceed, or transgress civil forms of civic and democratic engagement taking forms that are juridically illegible, extra-legal, disruptive of the social order, strident or rude, whether this be in the form of riots or revolts, or through the use of humor, disruptive aesthetics, or eroticism in engagements with power. 
While preschool children may not be actively rioting in preschool, they are using the tools of unruliness, humor, disruptive aesthetics, and all manner of extra-legal subversion of the unquestioned and deeply entrenched rules and regulations of late modern schooling. In the contemporary U.S. context, children's bodies, emotions, and spaces are subject to ever more rigid control by a standardization, accountability measurements, and the implementation of higher and higher academic performance expectations for younger and younger children than ever before. Preschools and kindergartens of today more and more resemble what adults my age may recall of their own middle elementary grades. Such academic pushdown is often mandated at the expense of playtime, developmentally appropriate practice, and school and community culture. Escalating academic demands and rapid shifts in control across the grades promotes a destructive brinkmanship of redshirting, retention, standardization, vouchers, charter schools, testing regimes, parent triggers, achievement rhetoric, and privatization propaganda. In preschool, such destructive jockeying manifests itself as dissonance. Teachers must nurture and advocate for the same children they must sort, regulate, and control, while children must simultaneously engage in the expressive project of finding themselves and asserting identity, while also achieving a utilitarian form of readiness for a slate of externally determined, valuable futures. In short, children have ample fodder for rebellion. Okay, so now I'm going to talk, take a little departure from meditations on naughtiness and personhood and get down to brass tacks on the ethnography stuff that you came to hear about. I was lucky enough to stumble onto my research site, the New Elizabethtown Community School. It's a small, single round, uh, which means only one grade level, one class at each grade level, pre-K to six school in a rural setting in the northeastern US. The preschool serves a surprisingly diverse group of children who live in this tiny town, and that means everything from rambling 19th century farmhouses to trailer homes to a few very expensive eco dwellings um, nestled together on steep winding roads that are knee deep in dirt and ice and mud right now. The village library and municipal building do not have running water or flush toilets. Power outages are common. There are no retail shops, no street lights, and a few stop signs. Without either zoning or oversight, most people raise a surprising array of farm animals on their properties, and still others hunt the local fauna such that they begin winter with a freezer full of venison and wild turkey. But this is hardly Mayberry. At the time of data collection, the NECS preschool enrolled 13 children between the age of three and five, nine of whom were white, two African American, one Latino, and one Southeast Asian. Over half of the children received financial assistance as designated low income, and one child was diagnosed with a significant cognitive disability. Five children identified as male and eight as female. Most children attend full time, so that's 8.30 to 3.30 Monday to Friday, with the exception of a half day on Wednesday. Considering that most rural families historically opt for family or home-based care for preschool aged children, the fact that nearly all village preschoolers attended an ECS was testament to community ownership and support, as well as its very low subsidized fees. The school was open to new Elizabethtown residents only, and the friendships and familiarities that were developed between the children and between the children and the school personnel are long lasting. So it was not uncommon, given the stable nature of enrollment, for children to graduate from sixth grade having known every single classmate since they were three years old. Um, the teachers in the classroom, Joya and Patty, are both white females who'd been working in this community for a decade and had, had careers in early childhood for lasting 20 years or longer in Patty's case. The preschool curriculum can best be described as a child-centered project approach with close to two hours of free play exclusive of recess or other outdoor time every day. Despite the head teacher's philosophical preference to the contrary, she was required to use one prepackaged character education curriculum purchased and mandated for the entire school. According to its promotional materials, this uh, emotional learning, which is a pseudonym program, provided social emotional skills, emotional management problem solving, um, and had lessons like paying attention, staying on task, following directions, identifying angry feelings, calming down, things like that. The lessons are facilitated using scripted uh, laminated placards and puppets. Um, and this turned out to be important later on, as we will see. So hold on to that. So the analyses presented in this paper are from the first year. So this is 2012 to 13 of an ongoing project at NECS. These data were collected primarily through participant observation during morning play, so approximately four hours per week for an overall total of approximately 10 billion hours of sitting in block area tracing children's hands and pretending to eat plastic food. In actual actuality, I'm now approaching close to 500 hours in preschool, and the analyses I'm talking about today are from just the first 180 hours. Um, in addition to free play observation, I also interviewed teachers and parents and collected documents and did analyses. 
Um, in keeping with Davey's recommendations, I did not use audio or video recording to collect data in these sites. Um, rather, I had a small notebook in which I recorded all of my observations for immediate transcription. Um, and despite my similarity to a teacher, and for a very young child, any female um, adult in a building is automatically a teacher, I was cautious to never be involved in mediating children's disputes or enforcing classroom rules. While children in the midst of some act of mischief might look at me with great guilt in their eyes, they came to expect that I would not interfere. This became difficult when they would injure each other or were particularly cruel, um, so I just had to you know, hold on. Um, as I collected data and transcribed my field notes and cataloged them along with other artifacts, interview data, researcher journal, um, data analysis was ongoing and took some cues from a uh, grounded theory technique um, as well as a low inference code book. Uh, I used a lot of triangulation of findings, and which usually meant asking both a preschooler and a teacher if my interpretations were correct. Um, so normally the methods talk is where I typically say as little as possible and you can ask questions later, but because I am reflecting on ethnographic work in this paper, I do want to spend a little bit more time talking about why I think that's important. Um, I want you to know that I locate my work in the interpretive tradition of the ethnography of childhood that positions children's culture and childhood as, quote, an independent place with its own folklore, rituals, rules, and normative constraints within a system that is unfamiliar to adults and therefore best revealed through research. And that's from James Jinkson Prout. James and colleagues continue that this orientation towards children and their culture can affirm children's agency, intentionality, and provide the tribes of childhood with the status of social worlds, ensuring that such a form of child life can begin to receive detailed annotation. However, it also risks the facile and the cute, generating whimsical tales rather than descriptive accounts, and further disadvantaging children with the researcher's own adult nostalgic projects. James and colleagues further cautioned the ethnographer of childhood to avoid allowing one's understanding of children's culture to be used as a mechanism for enhanced control. And I think this is important as I study naughtiness. Um, they write, the ever looming panopticon may explode into fruition once the interior and the ontological become readily available. So I attempted to tread cautiously throughout this project, keeping in mind these caveats, as well as those presented by my own location as a former classroom teacher and also a parent of three young children. I was able to gain access to the site because of previous connections with the teacher and my familiarity with her classroom practice. And that relationship and my stance as an ethnographer made me an unobtrusive visitor. As noted above, I was very, very careful to avoid being classified as a teacher. But in my interactions with children, I knew I would never be, nor would I want to be, um, a peer. Uh, to attempt to enact the role of a child, or even a very large grown-up child, would create obvious problems of trust and feasibility. As such, participant observations were modified by my position. I adopted the strange role of the researcher as a special species um, of adult. My notebook, in particular, was a site of interest. Children frequently asked me what I was writing and were interested in also writing things down on small pieces of paper pretending to be Sally doing research. Some older children had questions about what I was doing and I would answer that I was interested in children and wanted to learn about the games they play because children's games are very important. Later on children began to consider the weight of writing things down with multiple requests that I write down what was happening that so and so was not allowed to play or other things of great importance. So let's get to the games. So the preschoolers spent roughly two hours every morning in free play in designated areas in the classroom. So dress up, dramatic play, the kitchen area, block area, book area, dollhouse area, and painting and writing centers. Um, and this is not a picture of the actual classroom. This is a stock image that I use with permission. Um, uh, this arrangement was highly unusual, uh, as most preschools have um, escalated demands on student performance. But in a developmentally appropriate early education environment that emphasizes play, this arrangement is, is standard. Uh, there were also other activities like media tables, stacking cubes, magnetic tiles. The teachers spent the free play period working on classroom projects and covertly listening and watching the children, but never engaging in play themselves. Intervention from the teachers was minimal. Joya only became involved in children's disputes if they sought her help or if it just became out of control and she had to step in. The children organized their free play period into a series of games that involved multiple material sets and multiple spaces, usually repurposed to fit the evolution of the game. Games were developed and games were always given a name. So for example, there was the kitty game, the ninja game, the pirate game, the castle game, the baby game, so on and so forth. And these are repeated and the kids know the rules. Um, while there were some activities during free play that were isolated events, games were recognizable and followed consistent patterns and scripts. I'm gonna talk about two games today. One is the sleeping family game and the other is the gymnastics game. And I'm going to describe how these games are locations for mischief and unruliness. So the first one, which is my favorite game, is the Sleeping Family Game. The Sleeping Family Game was among the most frequently played games in preschool. While anyone could participate in the game, it was primarily attractive to the younger children, so the three and four-year-olds. And it had three stages. Constructing a hidden place where the game can occur, 
furnishing that space with bedding and plastic and trash and clothes and pretend food and things for the cubbies and shoes and nakedness. And three, inhabiting the space. So I'm going to read you a vignette about the sleeping family game. Just before 9 a.m., Isaac buoyantly announced, let's make a tent. Interested parties gathered around him quickly. Isaac and Martina pulled several large sheets and blankets from dramatic play, where the blankets were intended as tablecloths, and with help from Isaac, draped them over an upended, similarly repurposed wooden structure, which was originally part of dramatic play. The tent was constructed in a place where the storefront stands, the center of the classroom, and was easily visible to teachers and others, so covering it completely was very important. The space inside the tent was large enough for four or five children to gather, but it was difficult for teachers who were physically larger to either participate by entering or by watching the children from outside. Bonnie and Tucker pulled pillows and seat cushions from the window seats in the book area and pushed them into the tent to make beds, while Josepha gathered blankets, which were really repurposed scarves and clothes from the dress-up area, so all the children could rest comfortably in their beds inside. The construction and furnishing of the tent happened very fast, probably three minutes or less, after which Bonnie, Tucker, Martina, Isaac, and Josepha crawled inside and snuggled up together, making contented snoring noises and cuddling. Isaac says quietly, I am the dad, and I'm also the brother. Josepha says, you can be the brother. Martina says, I am the mom. Josepha says, I am the big sister. Bonnie said, you can be the uncle or the mom. The children assume fluid, familial roles to populate their new shared space and explain their relationships. Having decided who plays the mom, the dad, the siblings, the aunts, grandmothers, the babies, and so on, the sleeping family left their cozy beds to seek sustenance. Tucker took a push cart from block area, and along with Josepha and Bonnie, filled it with the entire contents of the dramatic play kitchen and home area. They collected every dish, plastic food items, scrap of play money, and all the dress-up shoes, necklaces, hats, cloths, plastic baby dolls, and stuffed toys their arms could carry and dumped it in the tent on top of some members of the sleeping family. Now we have food, they exclaimed. They crawled back into the tent and noisily pretended to eat. A few of the preschoolers began undressing and squealed and howled with delight. Their eating was ravenous and animalistic, with loud gnashings and growlings as they flew the plastic, through the plastic food hither and yon, gathering large amounts of plastic toys in their arms and throwing it in the air inside the tent. As the loud chewing sounds diminished, Bonnie and Tucker began growling, meowing, and barking while rolling on the floor. Isaac noticed and said, you are our kitty and puppy. He produced a leash from the mass of toys and attached it to Bonnie's collar. It was not long before the great ruckus commanded the teacher's attention. She approached the wildly escalating game and kneeling, pulled back the tent flap saying, making a home is perfectly fine, but trashing is not. Trashing is her word for indiscriminately filling a play space with small toys and then rolling in them or stomping on them. She continued, if you want to play that you are eating, you can set a table. You can put food on the plates and organize, but you cannot just throw things around. This makes a big mess and you end up stepping on things and breaking them. The children listened dutifully. Joya walked away and watched them from a distance. The children continued their thrashing. She then announced it was time for cleanup, and the formerly energetic children trudged slowly and wearily and complained they did not know how to put things away and that they were hungry and they all needed to use the toilet. The game was over. Okay. So now let's talk about the gymnastics game. So while the sleeping family game happens in sort of the high visibility center of the classroom and it's loud enough to warrant adult attention and is therefore extremely short lived, the gymnastics game avoids these pitfalls and subsequently lasts much longer. Also, while all of the children at one time or another play sleeping family, only the creator of the gymnastics game, five year old Delia, and a highly selective subgroup of female friends play the gymnastics game. The gymnastics game occurs in three stages. One, setting up a gymnastics space in a hidden part of the classroom. Two, Delia selecting a friend to partner with her in the space and a friend or friends to systematically exclude from the space. And three, constructing a play narrative to be acted out both inside and outside the space while Delia continues to inhabit it. So, most of the children had arrived for the day and were engaged in activities around the room. Delia quietly removed couch cushions and pillows from the window seats in the book area. The sleeping family game was in full swing, and many of the best cushions were already taken, so Delia slipped her hand under the edge of the tent and removed one of those cushions without anyone noticing. Sarah, also five, took a few pillows from that game. Both children headed to the far corner of the classroom where the brooms, dustpans, sleeping mats, and outdoor equipment are kept against a door. This corner is not visible from the teacher's desk or from the common activity areas. Delia and Sarah pushed the cushions underneath the storage table in this area and used the rest to cover the tile floor. Delia stretched out on the cushions and studied the arrangement, with Sarah laying down next to her. The girls cuddled together, their bodies touching, whispering. After some time, Delia noticed Lizzie, also five, nearby. Delia caught Lizzie's attention and announced that she and Sarah were doing gymnastics, an activity that Delia's older sibling does as an after-school job. 
Lizzie rushed over and asked to join in. Delia is aware that one hard and fast rule of preschool is you can't say you can't play. However, an important point of the gymnastics game is creating an exclusive space, and that requires that a child play the role of the authentically excluded person. So Delia said, I'm so sorry, Lizzie, but only two are allowed in gymnastics. This space is not big enough for three. Delia said this with a sympathetic look on her face, as if she were an official delivering sad but necessary regulation. Variations on this might, allow, might include allowing Lizzie or another child into the game and ejecting Sarah, using similar reasoning as, Sarah, you have to sign up for gymnastics. You haven't signed up, so I'm sorry, you can't do this activity today. Of course, there is no sign up. The excluded person is disappointed, but she typically nods in agreement and goes to play somewhere else. Ordinarily, any attempted exclusion in preschool is cause for alarm, with children running to the teacher to report a violation of you can't say you can't play, and waiting excitedly for justice to be meted out. But Delia's purposeful exclusion raises no alarm. Delia and Sarah returned to doing headstands and talking quietly while Delia began to craft a play narrative. Pretend I am the coolest girl in town, she says, and we're going to have our own kingdom with lava and dinosaurs. And you're my friend who can never be as cool as me, but you have to go into the lava and get a throne for me to sit on. She directed Sarah to venture out of the game space and commit an act of brazen mischief to make off with Joya's small black teacher chair. The teacher chair is a forbidden object, located in the corner of block play, where Joya sits to facilitate circle. It is a rule of the classroom that children are not to molest the teacher chair, and until this point I believed it was actually beyond their scope to actively abduct it. Sarah, however, did not hesitate. She poked her head out of the game space and peered around the corner, quickly zipping out, snatching the chair, carrying it back to Delia, and immediately stuffing it under the table as they nervously glanced around to see if anybody was watching. Then they went back to doing headstands. Joya had been watching Delia and Sarah for some time, listening carefully to their exclusionary tactics and waiting to see what would transpire. After another child was turned away, she did intervene and retrieve the chair, without chastising Delia, but rather by instituting new rules. These rules included moving the game out of the corner into a central space, allowing children to play through the instigation of a turn-taking regime with an hourglass timer, and making actual gymnastics part of the game. In its new regulated iteration, the game no longer held any appeal for Delia or the original players. So there were lots of games happening in preschool. Those were just two. Um, these were of particular interest to me because they demonstrated what Morwenna Griffiths calls leaky and viscous practices. These reflect individuals' embodiments of practice rather than rigid rules and hierarchies. Whereas the efficiency models driving many of the conditions of what I call late modern schooling emphasize individualism and competition within a rigid externally determined hierarchy, Griffith's model represents the inverse, embodiment, diversity, and non-hierarchical, more democratic, and probably more chaotic distributions of relationship and power. Its boundaries are fluid, and in preschool, practices associated with families leak into practices associated with schools, and also teachers may leak into the domain of children, and children into teachers, while communities and spaces may similarly leak into and across boundaries, rendering them less rigid, more plastic, and perhaps less inflexible in daily practice. Similarly, practices may exhibit viscosity, the slow, sticky, highly situational flow of practice as it responds to internal and external changes. This serves to create communities and classrooms that are, to quote Griffiths, more like the Himalayas and less like a single peak of Kilimanjaro, end quote and they may be sites of resistance to surveillance control and regulation. It's through leaky and viscous practices that rural communities in general, and rural teachers and children specifically, may navigate and resist the intractable contradictions of contemporary schooling. Furthermore, the leaky and viscous, like the mischievous and unruly, are liminal and ambiguous, emphasizing connection rather than hierarchies. Unlike classrooms and where teachers and others associate silence, order, and time on task, discrete learning with actual learning, the noise of important games, like disordered roadmap of the town itself and the chaos of the naughty child, are all leaky, viscous structures that create, as poet Leonard Cohen writes, the cracks in everything that's how the light gets in. Now, I said I didn't want to wax romantic, and I'm not going to do that. Rural schools, even like NECS, are not exempt from surveillance and control. Like most places where young children spend a lot of time, they're institutional in an increasingly total sense, to the consternation of this ethnographer and others. As Wisconsin's own Beth Grau writes with Fred Walsh, quote, the nature of children's lives in such institutional spaces are such that they are constantly under the watchful eye of adults. Children are rarely given private places to work and play. Teachers and caregivers are told that they must be able to see all the children all the time. The boundaries of children's experiences are patrolled by adults." End quote. However, as Grau and Walsh go on to observe, children are not without power in these settings. For example, they write, kids often do stuff to keep adults at a distance. Stay away from the climbing structure unless you want to hear fart jokes, for example. 
these tactics may be unruly. As I reflect on months spent observing the gymnastics game and the many participants of the sleeping family game, I recall the many times I had to stop myself from intervening in the midst of the mean and the disruptive, the cruel and the wild and the unsafe that I saw as part of those games. I would look beseechingly at the teachers to stop the activities and alleviate my discomfort. In effect, these games represented the children at their most unruly and me at my most squeamish. The manipulation, exclusion, and exploitation of the gymnastics game was a disruptive aesthetic, as were the activities of the sleeping family. As an observing adult, I felt both the horror of abjection and the ontological insecurity such unruliness promoted. This discomfort was certainly located in my own adult baggage. This is to say, in a cultural investment in the nostalgic project of the innocent, well-mannered, idealized child, and my impossible struggle to reconcile that with the spectacle that important games in preschool present. A rigid hierarchy of control is difficult to enforce in an unruly environment, and it would be undesirable as well. But one informed by leaky, viscous practices may afford a teacher and students the cushion of ambiguity helpful for navigating contradiction. Joya did eventually intervene, breaking up the games, but before doing so, they continued for quite some time. I hesitate to say that Joya allowed the games to continue. The games filled the space in such a way she could both actively resist intervening as well as be compelled by the game itself. Rules themselves are applied in both directions. The prohibition against trashing in the sleeping family game has been and will continue to be easily broken, and the new rules for the gymnastics game served only to break up that particular game, but did not shame the particular children. While Joya was charged with safety and surveillance in her role as teacher, the rules were leaky, letting the games go on, giving the children time to develop their mischief before finally breaking up the escalating unruliness, knowing that it would only begin again the next day. While Joya could have instituted a much more flexible, inflexible regime of disciplinary control in the classroom with children at desks, moving about by bells, assessed for time on task or other measures, she chose to continue her leaky viscous orientation to control. The children transformed teacher-created play spaces like the block area into hidden worlds populated with fluid relationships. They constructed a tent as an impenetrable location too small for adults and too dark to see the goings on within. Delia and her friends stealthily took control of a space that was neither official play space nor teacher space and located their resistant mischief in the margins of the classroom out of sight. They also took control of the teacher space by abducting her chair. When the teacher broke up the game and transformed it into something more controllable, Delia found new ways to control and occupy a range of illegal and legal spaces, and the sleeping family game rebuilt their tent every single day, fully anticipating its destruction, but reveling in the transitory resistant experience as a product of the now and then a process for later. So I said I would come back to the emotional learning curriculum. Um, it was considered to be among the better character education curriculum by most teachers in the area, but it still constituted a form of social control aimed at what Megan Bowler would say is taming the labile student. With its stiff plastic laminate lesson plans and scripting, it seemed terribly out of place. Yet one must resist the temptation to cast the curriculum as malevolent and the children as its innocent victims. These children are powerful. They put the curriculum to work like any tool, using the discourse of the didactic materials to further their own projects. For example, when Tucker approached Delia and asked to play the gymnastics game, Delia mimicked the firm but caring tone and the specific words the teacher modeled in the program lessons. I'm sorry, she said, but only two are allowed in this game right now. I can tell you are feeling sad. Try again later. This is not recognizable as a reportable exclusionary offense and thus not contestable, like so much of the emotional literacy program, which legitimizes savage feelings with official words. When I later asked three-year-old Elise what was going on after she had been rebuffed from the art table by Josepha, who said, I'm sorry, but you need to sign up for this activity. She told me it was okay because Josepha was using her words. The preschool children repurposed not only the language and intention of the curriculum, but also the intentional activities and materials provided by the teachers. They carefully constructed dramatic play to repurpose it for the sleeping family game. Sofa cushions and pillows furnished the antisocial gymnastics game in the broom corner. Players in the sleeping family game took off their clothes and became animals, growling and spitting. It took considerable time to get everyone dressed again as you can imagine. However, repurposing and confounding these structures was not possible all the time. In one particularly poignant instance, instance, Joya and Patty were doing the yearly assessments, one of an increasing number. This required them to sit with one child at a time and ask that child to do a series of tasks. The children did not understand why their friends could not help them with the items they did not know. And eventually the assessment had to be moved to another room. So, 
One particular rainy morning, the preschoolers were lined up in front of the classroom sink, preparing to wash their hands before beginning an unusually structured art activity. As each child finished washing hands, he or she was instructed to find their name card at the table, choose markers, paste and colored papers, sit by their card and wait for the others. This multi-part instructional sequence was overwhelming for many of the children who had to be reminded multiple times about the order of operations. David, who was only three, sat down on the floor refusing to move through the prescribed steps. No, he said, I cannot do this. I am still small. He threw himself to the ground sobbing. David's unruly actions forced the adults around him to acknowledge, if only, moment, if only momentarily and with frustration, some of the contradictions between expressive individualism and utilitarian control. To wit, he compelled the adults around him to recognize his immediate being rather, at the current moment rather than his future becoming. And he did so with the powerful tools at his disposal. As I think about these data in the context of my own reality as a parent and educator grappling with neoliberal audit culture and its attendance, my Cassandra-like desperation to get as many parents as I can to opt out of standardized testing, my frustration with teacher education's death by accreditation, and my daily witness to Joya's hard work justifying play-based preschool day after day after day, I began thinking differently. I'm not arguing that we as ethnographers and educators become the civic equivalent of naughty children acting out in tears and tantrums against that which we cannot change. Nor do I wish to offer a romantic, soft-focused PN to all we can learn from children. We are, however, presented with difficult contradictions and few straightforward official avenues for recourse. We may be left to our wits, leaky and viscous practices, and the cushion of ambiguity they afford, and of course, the pleasing unruliness of Kana's gentle anarchic theory. The preschoolers, teacher, and school, like us, are subject to technological conditions that shrink space and make the realities of external compliance and control much more immediate than they really are. The tentacles of No Child Left Behind, for example, are both distant in Washington, D.C. and also immediately at our door via the ever-expanding reach of information technology, social media, and accountability mechanisms, as well as the reshaped consciousness of that penetrative immediacy. That means that we, like the preschool children, must exist at what Giddens calls the intersection of estrangement and familiarity. We must all function amidst the ghostly presences of distant social processes that bifurcate our daily practice and seek to tame our own labile possibilities, such that we will follow the rules simply for the sake of following the rules. This is true even as, like David, we employ the guerrilla tactics at our disposal to make space for a contradictory, ambiguous now in the face of distance, more rigidly controlled tomorrows. Thank you very much. Hooray. This is called wait time. I'm curious about the decision to sort of um, to sort of be a bystander. Um, how sure. do you think the kids make sense of that? You know, I I had to, to bystander to me when people are torturing each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, that and that was nothing compared to some of the things I saw. I mean, some of the kids were really violent with one another. Um, and I knew that uh, as soon as I intervened, you know, because I was a teacher, and my instinct, I, and I have to stop myself, my instinct is to jump up and say, you know, let's use your words, tell them how it feels when you, you pinch, the, they pinch your face, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but I knew as soon as I did that, the children would no longer misbehave in front of me, and then I would no longer see what was going on. And the first few times that people did something really bad um, in front of me, they would look at me and, oh, she's going to tell. And then they'd see I wouldn't tell. And then it was just like, whoa. And eventually, they for, you know, I was there so much, they kind of figured I would just sit there. Um, I never asked them what they thought about it. It would be interesting to find out. But I, I just knew that I couldn't intervene if I wanted to get anything remotely authentic ever again. But it's hard. Because some of them, I mean, there was one child who um, came from a really traumatic um, home situation who would um, who would go to younger children and pinch them like on their inner thigh right where it would really hurt and she'd pinch them so hard her hand would shake and I knew she was doing it just to hurt someone because it delighted her and um, the teacher I mean the teacher's watching the teacher knows but it was all I could do to not stop that child but I knew that I, I couldn't if I if I was seeing something and I was confident no other adult was seeing it and it was really pathological I would probably say something to the teacher but I would never do it right there in front I don't know if I have a question, but maybe just your comment on this. There's, you know, all this research coming out now about the chemicals and everything that kids mm -hmm. are exposed to. Um, 
and they're just so it's they're kind of unruly, but it's there's mm -hmm. something neuro it's like something chemical going on, like all these misfirings. So I don't know. Kind of reconcile I, I think kids. I think kids are. I think unruliness and sort of the kind of Akshay Khanna sense of it is not so much a pathology as it's something that's a normal response. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, um, and I don't want to romanticize it, but I, I do think that there's, rather than just seeing control as an absolute good, I think we need to think why are, why are we doing that? What is the function of getting children to sit quietly when maybe unruly behaviors have, there's a reason for them, you know, um, they go a long way. And I'm not advocating, you know, riot, but I think that, um, I think about David, the last vignette I talked about where he, um, you know, he threw himself down on the ground and he wasn't going to do it. Mm -hmm. And the teachers would have to make him. Um, and it was, he didn't have the words at three to say, this task is not developmentally appropriate for me. It is more than I can do. So what did he have at his disposal? To stop, to stop it all. Um, and to get people's attention, right? And somebody might say, oh, look at that naughty child. He's not compliant. But compliance and goodness are not the same thing, and they're so often conflated in a, in a school context, especially early childhood context. So that's, that's kind of where I come from with that. And I love Akshay Khanna. I love it's crazy, it's crazy stuff. Were there alternative interpretations that you considered? So, um, I mean, educational spaces are so contested, mm -hmm. and I think particularly with the age group that mm -hmm. you were studying, sort of power and control and mm -hmm. boundaries, and yeah. it's such a fundamental part of kind of the, what people are navigating at that age, but mm -hmm. um, thinking about like, like I can imagine how like from the teacher's perspective, the, or from your perspective, sort of exclusion would be um, uh, about power and control or the sort of unruliness it would, in the classroom would look sort of unruly, but I'm wondering if there might be something in the perspectives of the children that sort of mm -hmm. put it on a different. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, if it was a different, if, if it was about power and control, I mean, it, uh, like thinking about, like you just mentioned something about not signing up for gymnastics. Mm -hmm. if you didn't sign up, I'm sorry, you can't be. Yeah, and there's, like, and there's no sign up, and it's yep. not even a thing, but it's something she heard, and she's like, oh, or this is a way I can break You know, like I wonder if it was something in her own life, mm -hmm. or in their collective experience, mm -hmm. sort of outside of the yeah. classroom where they had, were navigating in and out and those Mm -hmm. types of things that when it plays out in the classroom environment they become about sort of control and power and control mm -hmm. but I wonder if in the children's sort of lived experiences if mm -hmm. they might be uh, trying to master sort of other kinds of experiences I just wonder how you thought about sort of I didn't interview the children and ask them what they thought about these particular in instances I think it would be interesting to draw up you know, a, like a story I could tell them about, well, well, let's talk about this child doing this, what do you think is going on? But I don't know that it would be as, I don't think it would be as useful to my, my purpose as, as I'd like to fantasize that it would be. Um, I think that when we look at the larger questions of personhood control and power, I mean, kids want power of their own lives. They want to have control. I mean, everybody does, and, and mastery of self and ability to determine what you're going to do. But children are going to get around. It's like water and rocks, right? They go around you. It's not you really, if you battle for control with a preschool, you're going to lose. It's not, it's not about that. But I think that a bigger question is why, when people go to school, when little children go to school, when we put children in, in a schooling environment at any age, we need to grapple with the question of what is school for? And I know that's a huge cop out and a giant question. But w children in preschool, what are they there for? Are they there to learn how to do school? Are they there to, to learn to raise their hand and to walk in a line? And if so, why? Is that what school is for? Is it a sort of Tayloristic machine that we're trying to create? I mean, what, are, what is the purpose? Are we educating them for now or for later? Or is it both? Or is it, ch is it child care? Is it you know, uh, compulsory schooling to move forward a labor population? I mean, there are a lot of different discourses happening. Um, and I don't, I don't know what I think the answer is. Uh, I think that the teachers in this classroom would say that the purpose of preschool is to learn through play and to learn about self through play and to learn about other through play. That would be their idea. And for that reason, they have a really difficult time with the sort of push down that they're experiencing where children are not there to learn through play and through experience in a developmentally appropriate multi-age setting, but rather that they are there to complete assessments to determine readiness for this other thing, whatever it is. Yeah. Yes. When they're torturing each other? Yeah. yeah. I'm wondering if you could talk about, I think that decision makes a lot of sense in terms of building relationships with the kids. Um, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that may have shaped your relationship with the teacher and sort of 
So, so that's interesting because whenever I do work, I mean, I, most of my work isn't funded. I have like this much money and I make it go a long way. But I, didn't, I couldn't pay the teacher an honorarium for helping me. I couldn't buy her a whole bunch of uh, classroom materials. I did help her write a grant for some playground equipment, but I mean, she could have done that on her own. Um, but what I did do for reciprocity for this was I gave her my field notes because she needed them to complete the gold assessment. Um, it was, I was an extra observer. Um, she didn't get the same field notes that I got. Let's put it that way. I took out a lot of things. All of my annotation, I think this, I think this, I took that all out. So all she got was discrete observation, which I think is the responsible thing to do. Um, and she did know. I said, I saw X, you know, actively draw blood from Y. So she got, she got this stuff. And it was, none of it was news to her because she's also watching during free play. Um, so I don't think that they felt like I was failing to inform. Um, and I think they, I mean, I, these teachers understood that what I needed to do. Um, but you know, it was really hard for me. It was really, 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 really hard. And it was hard um, to see the little teeny tiny ones hurt or sad and not to run scoop them up. You know? um, and that was hard not to do that um, because I'm a, I'm a parent and I have little teeny tiny ones at home. Um, but I, I, I had to keep thinking, you know, I'm never gonna be a child, but I also don't wanna be a teacher and I don't wanna be mommy. And they have only two ways of categorizing an adult female, right? So that's the way it had to be. And I didn't want people to start tattling to me either, you know? Because if somebody comes up and says, oh, and so did this to me, and you say, well, why don't you tell the teacher? Or, oh, that sounds really sad. How do you feel? You know, it's a different thing. I don't know if that answers your question, but it was super hard. <laughs> super, it's still, I'm still at this site. I'm still doing research at this site, and it's still super hard especially this year, which it's a two-year program, so threes and fours, and then they go to kindergarten. And this year, um, the group is really, really, really young. They're tiny, and it's been a totally different ball of wax than some of the, I mean, I got lo really a lot of sophisticated data from the first two years, because they were, they, it was more of a, a ballast of fours and fives and not as many threes. Um, and so you get more sophisticated games and play, and this year you don't. You get a lot more injury <laughs> this year than previously. I've got, two, you, can, you can duke it out. There's two, two questions. And I have a question along the line of what other folks have asked about um, your decision and how you interacted with the kids. Mm -hmm. And my question is, um, what was your decision making process in deciding not to interact with the kids at a playful level? And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm guessing that when you're in their space, they have maybe approached you to say, hey, you want to be the grandma or something? Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in, in that decision-making process, like you said that you didn't intervene when they got kind of violent. Each other, yeah. yeah um, how might that have affected how you interpreted their interactions by deciding not to interact? Well, when I first started, I was super excited that I would get to play. I really wanted, I'd been reading Bill Corsaro, and I really wanted to enter play. I really, really wanted to. And at first, I tried a couple of times, and they were just like, Who, what are you doing? You, you stupid person. We will never let you play. And I even got a puppet and made a little, I mean, I did, it was humiliating. Um, but they will never let me play. They won't. After I'd been there for a little while, then people started bringing me little plates of plastic food. And then I would eat the food. Or they would, um, they would come up and stand next to me and kind of rub me a little bit. Just a little, just to be, you know, on me. And I got head lice so many times. Because um, if the head lice child, you know, the child you can see the hair moving comes to hug you, you hug them and you just deal with it. Um, and that's what I did. So I got some of that. Um, occasionally I would have somebody come up to me and demonstrate what they were doing. Like um, uh, one of the games, the pirate game, they're all pirates and they're, I'm going to kill you with my sword. And I say, oh my goodness, I'm so scared. And then they laugh and they run away. So I was allowed to interplay in these very, very small ways, but I was never allowed to interplay in the way a child would interplay. And when I attempted to find ways to enter the game, they would just laugh. It was, they would just go away. You don't belong here. So I was never taking a position where I was like a droid in the corner, not inter like, I'm not here. Pretend I'm not here, like behind a bird blind or something. It was never like that. Um, but they knew I'm not a child and I will never be a child. But I didn't want them to deduce that because I am not a child, I must be an, a teacher or a mother. So I wanted to be this other species, the researcher, which means I sit there and I write. And I interacted with them a lot, and I would stay for circle and story, and you know, I had a kid in my lap most of the time. And there was one child who, um, 
who had a significant cognitive disability who could not speak. And every day the child would come to me like this and put their hand on my notebook and I would trace their hand that every day. And I go there now and the child is in first grade and the child traces, it comes up to me every time I see them and I trace their hand and that is the thing that we do. So there are relationships there that are still in place but it was, it was a careful line and I think there's been reams and reams of stuff written and I, I probably need to read some of it about how you navigate that space when you're not, you're not mom, you're not a teacher but you're also not a child and they know you're not a child. I don't know if that answered your question but it was kind of yeah. rangy. Yeah. It's tricky and there's no, and it's very situational. You, know, you, can't, you can't go in saying I'm only going to do this because you, you don't. There's no good rule. How did they address you? Um, they call me Sally. Sally. Mm -hmm. Across the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The teachers are um, uh, Teacher Joya and Teacher Patty. Those are pseudonyms um, as a sort of honorific. And then in the rest of the building, teachers are Mrs. or Mr. or Ms. or what have you. Um, so I just, I just picked that because it made sense. Beth, you had a question. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering how you think about the cultural meaning of play in that context. Sure. Um, because it's very clear that the teachers have parameters on what mm -hmm. is appropriate play. The kids have parameters in terms of what they think is appropriate play. Mm -hmm. do, the, do the teachers ever enter children's play? Never. Never, ever. And I thought that was so interesting. Um, That's typical. And it was interesting because every now and then there would be a sub, okay, and the sub did not know. The sub, I don't know where they found the sub. And she would appear periodically and she would try to go play with the kids and the kids would be like, whoa, 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 whoa. And they would run away or she would try to interfere and they didn't know what to do um, because the teacher never interacts with the free play. So, right. building on that, what, think about what the cultural meaning is mm -hmm. there because mm -hmm. in a different... Play is something children do, adults do not do. Right, right. If, if you were in a place where play was joint activity mm -hmm. between adults and children. Yeah. Um, you might have a different experience. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there was a second site for a while. I had a second site. Um, and then there, there became some ethical, not related to me, but related to a teacher and the university, some other things going on. And I decided I needed to not be in that site, so I left. But I spent a year there. And at that site, there were a lot of um, young people volunteering. And so there was not, they played the games. And, and I found in that site, play was defined, I mean culturally defined, as an activity that is led by adults. And children did not come up with their own games. You didn't see these things. It was so very was, different. What was the definition in, in the site you worked in? Uh, the definition, according to the children, um, I would say that play was something that is an activity that is, com that is independent of adults and to be stealthily done, and adults disrupt the play. And the teachers? The teachers, I think they saw play as, um, I mean, they saw free play as something that's done as a le social learning activity um, in the mornings before we do, do circle and do those kinds of things. So I think they saw it as a, a learning task and something to be minimally involved in and only to interfere when it became dangerous or when a child approached you for help with a conflict. But it was a, it's a social lab, if you will, is how they thought of play. And the children, the, yeah. The trashing was dangerous? Well, if it became, it became so loud. I think that she responded to the loudness and the raucousness and the throwing and the screaming. And I, I disrespecting. Oh, she was big on organizing the materials, and everybody needed to have organizing the materials, and that upset her. Um, because you know there is this idea in school that if you're loud, something's wrong. And fifth grade is just across the hallway, and so I think she needed to get them to be quiet. Um, I don't know what would have happened if she let the sleeping family go on. I was fine with the noise. Um, and I, I wanted to see, but she let it go on, I think, as long as she could stand it before it, she became sort of the horror of abjection reached a point where she had felt like the principal was going to come down the hallway. Um, and the sleeping family, they did it every time. They knew she was going to take it down, but they got, they got away with it as long as they possibly could for their process. But it's interesting that your question about the, how you define play and then what counts as play. And I think when I look at the site now where it's everybody's little, there's people in diapers, it's tiny. Um, Play is very different. It's that sort of parallel activity. You don't have these extended uh, dram dramatic narratives. Um, and so framing for me w what I'm looking for is it's much harder. And I've done the strategy of the focal child. So I follow the one child. And that's how I've been able to penetrate a little bit of the practices going on there. Um, with the older children, it was very clear. I would look for, I, and, and this also speaks to, I think, a, a researcher problem. Um, I was very drawn to the things that were loud. 
in the classroom. So the classroom is about the size of this room. And the biggest part of it is block area, which is what the children, I use the words the children use, block area. And there's great big blocks. And it's a big open space. And it's usually dominated by the male children. And they're loud, and they take up a lot of space, and they're banging, and the pirates are going to kill people, and they're chasing with the thing. And it's, it's very evolved. And so I would go, and I would find myself spending all my time looking at the male children, children who identify as male in this setting, um, playing these games. And I wouldn't spend as much time watching female children doing quieter things in dramatic play or by in the, the, the gymnastics game off in the corner where they didn't want to be disturbed. Um, so I felt that was something that I learned about myself methodologically about halfway through is by just paying attention to that which is loud isn't always paying attention uh, with equanimity or to that which is important because you're drawn to those different types of play. And also I think, um, and I, I mentioned this a little bit in the talk, um, you're drawn to things that you like and that you want to watch that are cute. Uh, it was hard for me to watch the gymnastics game because they got pretty mean. It happened again and again and again. Um, so I would force myself to watch, you know, the, the what is it, the, um, oh, what is his name? Peshkin's Cold Spots, right? The idea that I, the things I didn't want to see, I would make myself do. Because otherwise you miss it. You know, you spend a lot of time there. I think that was, I think that's questions are maybe pull out a little bit of what I was wondering a little bit in terms of how in the classroom environment things can be constructed as subversive or about power, mm -hmm. but the right. sort of the children's lived experience of them could be quite mm -hmm. different. So thinking, sure, that's very you know, I'm imposing my own bias as a person who grew up in a rural community and a mm -hmm. very working class family, and thinking about what often is imposed on kids in schools, but mm -hmm. sort of that throwing the big tent where nobody can watch and have a big old rowdy fight, and then cuddling mm -hmm. up on the couch and hugging each other and loving each other mm -hmm. and just having a big old time, especially if it's sort of pre the learning, right? So if yeah. it's like, this is us coming together, mm -hmm. and if I think the teacher isn't... And it's fun. They're doing right. it because it's fun. Yeah. That's and why. If, and, if the t and it, I mean, they're cuddling. Like, they're taking care of each other, mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. feasting, and they're being rowdy together, and they're... And I think about, like, the way, um, uh, you know, I think working class families often view school as as both an opportunity for kids to advance, but also as something that kind of fractures mm -hmm. the fabric of mm -hmm. their lives, like it takes kids away from them. And mm -hmm. so I mm -hmm. think um, if teachers sort of stand outside of those familial connections that kids are forming with each other, then um, uh, I think so often we make sense of what kids' behavior means by how loud it sounds, mm -hmm. or by its impact on materials, mm -hmm. or on how it conforms mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think appreciating your stance about children sort of living their, they have their own rules and meanings and cultures mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and folklores. Like it sort of, um, you know, for the children, it might be a big old family reunion, and the reason it happened every morning is because they were coming back together. This is when we get to see each other again. It's a nice to be close, and we're a big old happy family. Mm -hmm. And so this is what circle time looks for us before we have to do that the teacher official lady circle time. Circle time. Yeah. Um, and so I just, you know, I wonder. Um, I think that there. One of the things I appreciated about your work is how closely you watched the kids and how much authority and agency you mm -hmm. gave them in their play and in mm -hmm. their lives and I think that there is so much room in the world for more work that does that it's on the ground and because really. people who care mm -hmm. about kids are so busy resisting the way that people are seeking to control them mm -hmm. I wonder if there are actually things that are internal to children's yeah. experiences that I'm we're sure I'm missing. sure there are and your point is fantastic um, you know the rural the, the and there's I, this paper um, hopefully very soon will be out in ethnography and education. It's a, a piece of this, this is a small piece of a bigger, a bigger paper, um, where I talk about the rural community um, and sort of the panopticon and what's going on. And I live in a mirror community in another section of this unnamed state um, with their almost identical demographic. Um, it, it's, and I, I hear what you're saying because the community, um, it was very unusual, the high levels of enrollment in a public preschool, because of this belief that it's fracturing these children. These are, these are kids who live on the farm, whose parents are hunting the local animals. Um, it's, a very, very, uh, um, it's a very different existence than, than most people have. And I was astounded at how many people 
how many kids were enrolled in the school. And I, I, I spent, a, it was a very tumultuous year that this data was collected at the school because the parents, if the sort of guerrilla politics in the area effectively ousted the school principal um, because you know, she came in with a very, what we call a very town aesthetic and tried to tell these parents they weren't doing it right. Um, and the teachers who were themselves not living in the town understood, I think, some of the, the, uh, the cultural scripts in place of that rural ethos, um, especially a community that is um, a community that's you know, culturally rich, economically poor, but also racially diverse, which is really unusual, um, and how, how those different discourses work together to create a community that was really, really tight. And the parents actually ousted that principal because she came in and told the kids that they didn't know how to act and parents didn't teach the children how to sit down and act right, and it was just you know, horrible. Um, so I, I saw that the, the families really saw the school as theirs, um, it's also in this in this area. Um, you know, the weather's really really bad, and the school is also the emergency shelter. It's the town library. It's all that kind of stuff. So it's a really really tight uh, community resource, and I think that may go part of the way. But you're right. There's, there's there are other things. There are other things going on there in terms of how the children think about it. And the sleeping family game was interesting to me, and I spent a lot of time thinking about it because I saw it every day, every single day, and it was so joyful and so chaotic. Um, kind of, and that's probably what mm -hmm. many of their families felt like, you know, like yeah, it, it yeah. sort of, I think I just, I'm a, one of the hard parts about doing this work, I think you're, you're studying a different community than you live in, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and in order to, to get the privilege to do that work, you have to lead the class that the children are yeah, actually yeah. living in, so mm -hmm. I think it's really hard work, and I'm very sensitive to it in my own mm -hmm. life, but, and it's, I think, a real asset in your work that oh, you, thank you are tending to multiple realities and mm -hmm. can honor it. And, I, and I, it's very clear that you don't have a deficit perspective of the No, no, the I, try, I, try, I, I try very hard. That. Thank you very much, I tried very hard. This was, I mean, this community was just, you know, fantastic, absolutely. You know, I had, the, um, I had a, a miscarriage while I was doing data collection there, um, relatively late in the game. And the community, they found out that I had been sick um, and people showed up at my house with food, um, with comfort, with cards, with flowers. Uh, it was, it was, I mean, it was, it was, that was, and we could all had the family tent game and the little kids came to my house and they said, oh, you know, Sally the researcher is sick and I drew you a picture. And it was very, um, I think on one, on one level people could say, oh, that's bad research hygiene, but it wasn't. It's the, it's the community there and that's how it was. And it was, it was beautiful. Well, I think in some ways that's the only way you can learn what the family tent game really means, right? Mm -hmm. Like, because in the classroom it might look naughty, but once you've mm -hmm. been to a big old family mm -hmm. dinner party, you might realize yeah. that, wow, yeah. this isn't naughty mm -hmm. at all. This is just the yeah. way people come. And I spent a lot of time, at, you know, I didn't talk about here, but I spent a lot of time in the community. I went to all the events. You know, I went to a lot of hockey games. <laughs> I did all those kinds of things. So it was, um, it was really, uh, I tried. Yeah. I tried. It feels like it. I can oh, well, thank you. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much. Well, I think that would be a great compliment to, to end. Uh, great. Um, thank you very much. Sally's going to be talking again tomorrow at noon. Um, I'll be talking about pirates <laughs> tomorrow. So, yeah. Talking about pirates. Talking about pirates. The title is There Are No Girl Pirate Captains. So we'll hear about that. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.